Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, next set of speakers. Paul Hiller with the uh, marketing manager from at ICML. Kenneth Bannister, program director at ICML 55. And Anna Corrin, the commissioner editor at R River Publications, publishers, I'm sorry, uh, who will help us understand ICML 55 standard series, the why, what, and how of uh, lubricated asset management. Enjoy the video. We'll uh, have some questions afterwards if you have any. Thank you. Hello, I am Paul Hiller, the marketing manager at ICML, the International Council for Machinery Lubrication. Do you remember back in 2019 when ICML rolled out part one of the ICML 55 standard for lubricated asset management? Yeah, good times. Well, part one was called ICML 55.1. It was the requirements document that was developed in response to ISO 55000 asset management standard. In fact, we wrote ICML 55.1 as an enabling standard, clearly defining 12 interrelated areas of a successful, sustainable lubricated asset management program, all written in lubrication-specific language that makes ISO 55000 concepts accessible and readily applicable to any inventory of mechanical physical assets. Well, that was over four years ago, and now it's 2023. So today's big news is that ICML has finally released the companion document, ICML 55.2 guideline, and it goes into expansive detail about how to implement all those requirements. Plus, there's also an overview document now, the ICML 55.0, and it provides an educational executive summary that establishes why it's so important to plan your lubrication management system or the LMS. So the completion of ICML 55 is a huge game changer for managers of lubricated physical assets anywhere in the world. They now have all the help they need to understand requirements, educate their higher ups, prioritize decisions, customize designs, assemble resources, and implement the best possible LMS for their unique situations, all with an eye toward auditability. So how do these three standards work together? The overview, the requirements, and the guideline? I was joined recently by Kenneth Bannister, our ICML 55 program director, as we participated in a podcast episode recorded for River Publishers. That's the company that prints and distributes the complete ICML 55 series for us. We were hosted by Anna Koren, the publisher's commissioning editor, as we talked about ICML 55 standards purpose and application, and also about its potential impact on the lubricated asset management landscape. Enjoy. Okay, good day. I'm here with Paul Hiller and Ken Bannister. My name is Anna Koren, and we'll be talking about ICML 55. So first question would be, could you provide a brief overview of the ICML 55 and its objectives? Uh, yeah, the ICML 55 is a, um, uh, an ass lubricated asset management standard, and it was uh, developed by ICML shortly after the ISO introduced its asset management standard in 2014. And the ISO standard, and Ken, you've gotten more experience with this than I do but generally the idea is that uh, the ISO standard was very broad in scope. It addressed all kinds of stand, uh, all kinds of assets, the financial assets, all the mechanical assets, human resource assets. Everything was under that umbrella, and so the ICML 55 was developed specifically to provide a pathway for those people responsible for lubricated mechanical assets. Uh, basically, it's written in lubrication specific language to make it easier for the folks in, responsible for all these lubricated mechanical assets to do what they need to do with their environments and their equipment and their machinery to make it compliant with ISO 55000. Your thoughts, Ken? Yes. So when we're looking at, I mean, let's, let's talk about 55000 because we talk about uh, that were modeled uh, very similarly to 55000. 55000 is holistic the way it looks at the assets and then in doing so it looks at 
all the soft assets like the training programs, the, the documentation. So anything that adds value to the organization is an asset. Whereas uh, in maintenance, we kind of think of assets as very hard assets like uh, machines, spare parts, and ICML 55, we wanted to be a little different because it, it is machine centric in, in the way we approach it. It's all about the machine and the bearing and placing the right amount of grease in the right place at the right time. Of course, there is still documentation that goes along with that in terms of the work orders and in terms of specification sheets for the lubricants. But more, more realistically, it's all facets of lubrication management as opposed to machine management or maintenance management. So that's the slight difference. It's uptime and life cycle based. Uh, ICML 55 follows the 55,000 in so much as it wants to understand and, and align with the corporate practices, with the and, and understanding what the stakeholders are requiring. So the production management, uh, uh, they want to align with the production side of it. They want to align with the purchasing side. All of those elements come into play, which is how basically how we line into the 55,000 series. And so when you look at a lubrication management system, that is the strategic plan, the policy, that is the lubrication plans, all of those elements come into play and uh, and the audit register. And so that's how we align with the 55,000. Once we move into the actual uh, maintenance of the asset itself with, lub with lubricants and lubrication and uh, looking at those elements, uh, we, we differ slightly because we're, we're more machine focused at that point. Yeah, and so it is important to, as you're saying, that we're in alignment with it. Um, in case people are wondering, is this supposed to replace ISO 55000? It's not. Uh, it specifically is um, uh, developed as an enabling standard to help people achieve ISO 55000 if that's what the goal is. But it certainly is aligned with it properly. Yeah, it's structured the exact yes. same way. On purpose. Yes. And that was on purpose. Yes, yes. And, and the thing is, is that lubrication is so important to mechanical machinery, uh, uh, moving machinery, it's not often given the attention that is that is needed to, to get the full benefit of lubrication because lubricants are engineered products and people often don't think of them that way. Um, one, of the wor one of the things that is, tends to be done is when a new machine comes in to an organization, uh, they'll forego the, lu the lubrication system and save themselves four or $5,000 and then place um, $30 worth of grease nipples in its place to mm. cut the costs. And in the end, that just costs them 10 times the amount that, of savings within the first second year, uh, primarily because of the ineffectiveness of the lubricating with a grease gun and, and, a, and a grease nipple. It's, it's a false economy in, in that regard. And it's often thought of as an afterthought in a lot of companies. So for instance, in many of the automotive companies, manufacturers, they would place people in the lubrication department who were ready for retirement. It was kind of <laughs> like a, a soft fall for them before retirement as a thank you. And, and it was an easy job. And they never always put the amount of effort that was required and then the level of understanding, oh, why anyone understands how to use a grease gun. Well, that's an agrarian sort of look at uh, outlook. It's a thing, you know, like they used to do at the turn of the century, uh, the, 19th, the 18th, 19th century, you know? And, and so it's, it's very much uh, that type of thinking. Whereas lubrication is, lubricants are very sophisticated these days. I mean, we only have to look at a car a new car that is now using um, a 05, where we used to use 1030 oils, which are much heavier, but they're gaining much more horsepower, uh, almost twice the horsepower in the same size of engine because of the better fits, limits and fits, and the better lubrication technology. And, and it's, it's, it, that's also passing itself down into um, lubricated assets in terms of machinery as well. It is a very sophisticated in terms of the building those lubricants and making them very specific. I mean, we only have to look at aircraft or space going into spacecraft, very, very unique types of lubricants, very, very critical to, to their operation. Uh, often we don't even think about it. If I'm talking at a, at a uh, conference or something, I'll say, how did you all get here this morning? You probably never thought about how you got here, but you came in a plane or you came in a car or you came, you, you, you came into the hotel, you took an elevator turned your air conditioning on, the HVAC system kicked up and everything else, and uh, you moved along a walk, walking escalator. Um, all of those elements, uh, if any of those didn't work, it would be a massive inconvenience, but they don't. They all work because they're lubricated and they're lubricated. They're running on a, a, a four micron film of lubricant and the whole world runs on four microns of lubricant. 
And if it's done correctly, the, the efficiency and the cost effectiveness of them are, is incredible. And ICML focuses in on that to get that level of efficiency and that level of cost effectiveness. Yeah, the whole idea of the standard there, as you've noted in previous presentations, is that uh, the standard takes the guesswork out of it. If the whole world's running on four microns of lubricant, you want to make sure to get it right the first time and keep uptime high and expenses low. And so rather than uh, sending your people out there and putting their hands all over the million dollar machinery and not know how they're, what they're doing fits into the, lubricated, the lubrication management system, you know, the standardization pretty much levels everything out, makes sure that everybody's on the same page and doing, doing things for the right reasons. Right. Yes. So lubrication management is important in terms of asset reliability, efficiency, and cost effectiveness. And the adoption of ICML 55 standards will benefit organizations. But can you explain the role of each of the standards in the ICML 55 series? There are, there are three uh, standards currently in the, uh, in the set. Uh, 55.0 is the first one, and that's an overview. And it shows how lubrication fits into the organization. And this is a, a very, a very quick read. And if you want to basically understand what the standard is about, its terms and its definitions, and to get a quick feel for the standard, this is the, this is the, this is the standard that you will give to management, uh, high level management. We don't have a lot of time to go into the study of it, but want to get an understanding of how it fits into the organization. That's the one you use. So that's an overview of the standard. 55.1 is what we call the what, and this is what, what you do this is the uh, the standard that you will certify to and there are 12 interrelated areas of uh, control that we've we've identified in that standard and then set out very um, incrementally set out what what that standard is what is was required to achieve that level of certification uh, it defines the auditable elements to be achieved in essence 55.2 is a, a bigger book and it's uh, kind of like the, this is the how and the why so this is how we go about it and this is why we go about it, it it's a guidebook to design implement and maintain and control a lubrication management system it explains the 12 areas and it goes through each of them uh, diligently and interprets the standard into practical terms uh, so this is the one that you would utilize, and this is the sort of the the, the, the lubrication speak that that people on the shop floor will understand, All right? So it's 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 meant to to interpret that uh, that that higher level standard into clear practical terms and give you uh, clear examples on how to uh, meet the compliance uh, of the standard, and it and it's an excellent. Uh, text, uh, body of knowledge text for ICML as well for the personal certification for, for the MLTs uh, and the MLA and the MLE sort of thing. Yeah. So that that's it in a nutshell very quickly. Two, there's the three right there. 55.2, it just shows you exactly how to do it. 55.1 spells out all the elements that you require. And uh, 55.0 is the overview. Management. Mm, so, how does the ICML 55 series contribute to enhancing physical asset management plans in accordance with ISO 55001? My first thought there is that, um, you know, when you're enhancing a, a, a physical asset management plan, the lubrication, uh, this goes back to the whole concept of having a standard approach at all. Um, by addressing all the 12 areas. Uh, uh, the the 55.1 presents so many considerations and makes you ask so many questions um, <coughs> to customize your management plan to your specific plant your and all your needs. Um, and so that standardization helps you leave nothing to chance, presents options and questions and things to consider to, for prioritization, things you might never have thought of otherwise. And one of those 12 areas, area 12, is the continuous improvement area. It's entirely possible that somebody without taking a standard approach using ICML 55 as a guideline might never really consider a continuous improvement approach, the plan do check act system, might never consider using that or applying it as, as a 
the specific thing to pay attention to. And without a continuous improvement system in place, your whiz-bang lubrication management system that you spend all this time and energy putting together might just be doomed to failure. So as an enhancement, I'm kind of thinking, Ken, that that continuous improvement area may be one of the linchpins in this whole program. Yeah, so building up on that, uh, what is next for ICLM? What is your vision of its future? What we're working on currently is um, is the actual certification program, which is being uh, put together as we speak. In in that part of that is to develop a 55-3 manual, which is primarily focused on the auditor and the assessor. It will look at how the auditor and the assessor will approach the audit in, in of itself. And it's used for, it will be used for the training of the audit, the internal assessors, which the, uh, the person going through the, the ICML 55 will have internal people who will start off by looking at the, assessing their own program and uh, we will be uh, giving uh, giving them the um, the training requirement for that to to do that and 553 will be part that manual that helps them helps them in that regard plus the external registrar auditors the third party auditors uh, that will actually audit and issue the certification for 55 551 um, they have to be trained also and the, the fifth so 553 will use will be utilized to, to train to train those as well and this is a whole new ball game because it, it is just like certifying individuals the people who go through training if they know there's going to be a certification exam and a credential at the end of it are more likely to uh, uh, pay attention and work toward that goal and but that's all we the icml has done for 20 plus years is certifying individuals so this model where we'll be certifying uh facilities in their and their programs that's a whole new ball game for us and so an organization that's going through and making all these improvements using the requirements and guidelines of icml 55 just like people sort of you know preparing for a certification exam if they know there's going to be an audit at the end of it and and they can actually as as ken has noted in other presentations fly the icml 55 flag then that is uh that can be big for marketing purposes it could be a big booster for employee morale you know our program has been certified icml 55 compliant in addition to doing individual certifications we're not dropping that <laughs> no absolutely not huh? no this is uh this is something that's um unique um in the world that's where we mm -hmm. have individual certifications and we have a corporate certification program uh, that meets at, at the same level as uh, some of the all the, the other major uh, standards out there. This is serious. <laughs> <laughs> serious. But that's still in the works. That's not that's not ready yet. Right. No, we're moving along at a good at a good pace on that one. Yes. Right. Well, well, that's exciting. Uh, well, we almost are out of time. So maybe before we wrap up, could you please share what you believe the main takeaway or the key message should be for our audience? Main takeaway for me is is the the image of these three books here. One of the main values of the of the ICML 55 is it brings the uh, asset management uh, questions from that broad overview of the ICO uh, ISO level and it brings all the questions and considerations and prioritizations and uh, the decision making points down much closer to the shop floor for managers that are trying to make their machinery assets and lubricated assets compliant in an ISO 55,000. Its value is that it takes it from the conceptual to the practical. Our, our main audience is the practitioners and managers of lubricated assets. All our programs and initiatives look at those people. So when this opportunity came up in 2014, where we said, you know, saw, hey, there's this great new ISO asset management standard out there but if it's not within reach if if the managers and hands-on practitioners can't wrap their brain around the iso document we would have been totally remiss not to put together some kind of a roadmap or a blueprint in the form of the icml 55 that brings all that asset management relevance down to where they need it and can grab it and use it and apply it it's part of our mission 
it is one of the least expensive things that you will ever do is to put in a lubrication management program in comparison to putting in a computerized maintenance management system, putting in a work order system. Compared to that, this is very, very easy. And the three standards that we put out there simplify it even more. And we give you all the best reasons to do it. I mean, we're looking at financial, we're looking at risk management, uh, improved services, uh, compliance to social responsibility, uh, improved efficiency and effectiveness. I mean, we've gone back, go back to the 60s where we had Peter Jost who, who coined the term tribology and came up with savings of, uh, of millions and millions of pounds as a result to the, grant, to the uh, GDP, uh, the gross domestic product, as a result of inefficient lubrication practices. That was followed up in the 70s by Ernest Rabinovich, who boldly stated that 70% of all um, bearing failures are directly or indirectly related to ineffective lubrication practices. Not that you didn't lubricate it, you didn't do it effectively. You can over lubricate, you can under lubricate. It has to be done correctly. And it's not that difficult to do it correctly. Sorry, the lubrication manufacturing companies have long stated that effective lubrication triples the life of your bearing. I mean, there's a lot of statements been made here and, and I can back all of those up through, through all of the work that I've done previously over the past 35 years or so. 18% savings in energy on a um, 100 ton straight side press because I tuned the lubrication system up properly. 18% savings, that's massive amounts and hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of energy a year just been thrown away as a result of ineffective lubrication. Gas field compressor stations. What we did there was we basically took, we changed it to a uh, synthetic lubricant. So they had the right lubricant in, in the station. But we made it so as it was replaced every two years as opposed to every year. That saved millions of dollars because of the two weeks downtime to do a oil change. The value of a, such a program and to put a program in, I mean, it's going to cost you a few hundred dollars, a couple of hundred dollars uh, to buy the books and then to even to just get your head around, get your head in there and start start this uh, and looking at it. And it's not, it's not that difficult to do. It just takes a little bit of organization. And if you're already at 50, if you're already doing 55 or you already have like 14,000 or 9,000 ISO, you've already got the methodology in place. You're already following that. Uh, it just steps right into it. And if you've done of those, this will very easily ease you into that type of thinking. And so if you wanted to go 55,000 afterwards, it's very easy to, up and adopt, into, to adopt in yourself into that, that method of thinking. Yeah, because so, it's already, because it's already that lubrication specific language. It's right yes. there. It's so accessible to, uh, to the, the industries and the people and managers that we work with. I think, I think it's time the world stepped up. <laughs> and save themselves a lot of money, do a favor <laughs> for the environment and do a favor for their production departments and reduce the amount of downtime and be more effective as a result. It doesn't take an awful lot. It just takes, it just takes a managed approach. And this is the perfect vehicle to actually adopt and, and use to, to get that. Well said. Yeah, I think that's a great conclusion. Okay, well, thank you for time to speak with me today. It was truly informative. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Thank you. There we are. <laughs> Sorry about that. Here we are. My controls. Well, hey. Uh, first of all, thank you, Paul, Ken, and Anna for that uh, for that video. Um, if Hey, if you have a email address, uh, Paul, that people can write to you or ask a question, you might want to give it out right now. Uh, otherwise, we've got about six minutes to get to the uh, next session. Yeah, it was on that last screen, but I just put it in the chat window as well. Excellent. Okay. Well, very good. Well, from Bayonne, New Jersey, we, uh, we thank you. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate it. All right. All right. Have a great day, everyone.